Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and welcome to the My Horse University and the Extension Horse Quest Live webcast titled Rehabilitating the Lame Horse. This webcast continues our horse health series, which will include one more webcast next month. Um, and if you have missed any webcasts in this series, you can view the recordings online on our website. Our presenter tonight is Narelle Stubbs, a visiting research associate at the Michigan State University College of Veterinary Medicine, um, the Marianne McPhail Equine Performance Center. She is a physiotherapist, University of Sydney, Australia graduate, gaining a Chartered Society of Animal Physiotherapy title while practicing in the UK with a focus on animal physiotherapy, both small and large. She returned to Australia to teach and complete the postgraduate master's in animal physiotherapy program at the University of Queensland. Norell is completing her PhD candidature requirements at the University of Queensland and investigating equine back pain. Since 1998, she has been the official Australian equestrian team physiotherapist, treating both horse and rider at the World Equestrian Games and Olympics. And please note that you are able to ask questions during the presentation via the text chat um, on the lower left hand side of your screen. And tonight we have questions that will be facilitated both by Dr. Ann Rashmir and by Aim uh, Nicole Rombach. Dr. Rashmir uh, presented last week's webcast on lameness in the performance horse, and she's an associate professor at Michigan State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. She earned her DVM from the University of California, Davis, and is a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, and she's been with us here at MSU since 2009. Um, and Nicole Rombach is a graduate student at the Mary Ann McPhail Equine Performance Center. And she's originally from the Netherlands, but studied in the United States to receive her Master Equine Body Worker certification. Um, and in the United Kingdom, where she graduated with a postgraduate diploma and a Master of Science in Animal Manipulation through the uh, McTominay College of Chiropractic and University of Wales. So the presentation will be today will be recorded and uploaded to our website if you want to review it at a later date. And at this time, I want to turn the presentation over to Narelle. Thanks very much, Amanda. And uh, in advance, thank you to Dr. Rashmir and Nicole for helping out with the questions. Uh, the title of the presentation is Rehabilitating the Lame Horse. And this is quite a broad topic. And when we're talking about lameness, this may be lameness in that the horse is being diagnosed with a particular pathology from your veterinarian right through to performance loss or back pain, um, which is um, a prevalent and, and key topic of interest of mine personally. Um, as Amanda has said, I work here at the McPhail Equine Performance Centre, which is a purpose-built centre looking at biomechanics or how the horse moves. And we're st currently studying a lot of um, areas in relation to rehabilitation and treatment techniques, and particularly those from an exercise-based uh, perspective, which we'll touch on uh, a little bit today in this lecture. Some of the areas that we'll cover during the lecture time is looking at how to keep your horse functionally sound along with rehabilitation and physical therapy techniques, assessment and treatment techniques. We'll touch on some of the research that we're doing here at the McPhail Centre and a lot of that research revolves around some specific exercises that you can do at home with your horses, whether that be in the rehabilitation process, whether that be when the horse is actually on box or stable rest or just doing walking in hand exercises, right through to facilitating different muscles, uh, increasing the horse's mobility and strength related to performance and performance enhancement. And a lot of these principles revolve around the conditioning process of your horse. And so we'll touch on some, all of these or some of these principles throughout the lecture. Please ask some questions as I go along and Nicole and Anne will do their best to answer those uh, for me along the way. The key thing I think to focus on is all of your horses are undergoing a lot of repetitive strain within their job. And this means that whether it be dressage, show jumping, eventing, reining, cutting, western pleasure, you're doing a particular movement pattern repetitively over time. And this often adds stress to certain structures in the limbs and the horse's back and body. And uh, Dr. Rashmir touched on some of those conditions and from the veterinary perspective, the diagnosis and 
treatment in that uh, last week. And here's just some examples of very high level performance horses, but these um, problems are, are, are across the board in most of our general riding horses as well as those that are competing at a, a weekly basis or monthly basis right through to the top level. In the picture here, this is all eventing horses for some very big competitions. The one on the left here, if I just make my little mouse button work, um, is from the Sydney Olympics and this is little Swizzle in with Andrew Hoy. Now he was really a management nightmare or dream, whichever way you want to look at it. He had multiple limb problems where he had degenerative joint disease in some of his distal limb joints, especially the coffin joint or the P23, that last joint that's sort of with inside the hoof, but as well as had some problems in his lower back area and some degenerative changes in his neck. So there was a lot of medical or veterinary management along the way, as well as a lot of treatment from both myself and from the grooms carrying out particular exercises constantly to keep him on the road and functioning in a relatively pain-free environment. This next horse here is also an eventing horse and this was actually at the Athens Olympics and when you generally look at this horse it's got a condition which is from repetitive strain over jumps. If you look at the top right hand picture here and this is another uh, an Australian rider Matt Ryan, the horse lands, doesn't know how deep the water is and there's a lot of force coming all the way up through the limb and especially in this lower neck area beneath the scapula. And what's happened in this horse in this image is that he has actually torn the muscles away from part of the vertebral bodies and you can see in this area that there's a really hollowed out appearance. So many horses have muscle injuries and that's in a key important role in your rehabilitation and physical therapy techniques to get the horse back on track. Sometimes horses have issues that you're actually not aware of that may be a precursor to other injuries occurring in the body. And what I mean by that is that not only just their job but how their muscles are developed and like us often horses can be diagonally one-sided or left and right to one side and this is another famous bottom of a horse who's retired was an eventer but if we look at separating the pelvis in half so you're going to look from the center and know the tails blowing in the wind so it gives you a little bit of um, a visual um, variation but if we look from the center to the outside of the pelvis, compare that side to this side, you'll see that one whole hemipelvis or one side of the whole horse's rear end is actually less muscled than the other. So it has a dominant hind limb push and stability and strength. So that often overloads the forelimbs differently as well and he had some history of forelimb issues as well. So from a management point of view, it's working as a team with veterinarians, the riders, the grooms, yourself, everyone working together to manage these horses and rehabilitate these horses. And this could be, as I said, the high level performance horse or your pleasure riding horse on the weekend. A lot of the management is catching things early, as Dr. Rashmia mentioned, and getting on top of those problems and manage the, managing them so they don't turn into a major issue which may be detrimental to the horse's uh, livelihood or job. I mentioned teamwork. This is a massive team, obviously, and this is what it takes to get the horses to these top Olympic levels. You've got these horses that are competing mostly as teenagers, so the equivalent of us in our sort of 50s and 60s. What do we get when we get old? Degenerative joint disease or osteoarthritis. So a lot of this management and rehab techniques are directed at this degenerative joint disease or wear and tear on the body. And obviously in this large team, you've got everything through from management to the veterinary all the little guys sitting down the front are all the key players. They're the horses, grooms that do everything on a day-to-day -day basis. And like you at home with your horse, it's actually stepping back and having new eyes looking at your horse to say, how does my horse really look today? If it's rehabilitated an actual injury, yes. What's happening with its muscles? What's happening with its joint range of motion? And how can I best affect those at home on a daily basis? Because you as the owner will have the biggest effect on the horse in the rehabilitation process.
A little bit of background about what physio or physical therapy is and rehabilitation. We all know that in the human field, physiotherapy or physical therapies had played a very large and essential role in all aspects of medical and sports um, medicine in the last century. And this is not only just musculoskeletal, but also from neurological conditions, cardiopulmonary or, or vascular conditions, as well as um, your conditions in your heart and lung, pre and post surgical care, rehabilitation setting obviously it's very known if you have a knee replacement or you've had surgery that you often have specific exercises you have to do and specific treatments even in the acute care setting in a big area in the human field now because of the money that for example back pain costs the society is injury prevention and performance enhancement and this is across all ages from period from pediatrics to geriatrics and obviously those elite athletes um, in the in the elite setting in the horse world now, most large teams will have a, a therapist, whether it be a physiotherapist or an acupuncturist or chiropractor or an osteopath that travels with the team to keep these animals ticking over. So now it's seen that there's greater advances also in veterinary medicine, especially in the last 10 to 15 years as far as diagnostic capabilities, surgery capabilities, and especially to do with orthopedic and sports science. And one area is in equine and back pain which I've been involved with some research and it's really highlighted the need for the the professional services offered by physical therapists trained in, in the veterinary field and allied health professions as I said including um, your chiropractic osteopathy and um, acupuncture. So what actually is physical therapy? You know, you might go and get your ankle look after, looked after after you've sprained it or you've, you've had your knee replacement or you've had back surgery or you've got disc disease. The difference between a veterinarian or a human doctor and a physical therapist is you, you have been provided with the, the what we call a pathoanatomical diagnosis. So the veterinarian has diagnosed your horse with, for example, degenerative joint disease of the hock or the tarsus, the ankle of the horse's back leg, or say sacroiliac disease. So we know that there's a lesion there that has been able to be either nerve blocked or a local anesthetic as well as other diagnostic tools to point in that direction. The physiotherapist will then come in and look at the whole horse from a functional assessment point of view. So we know where the primary pathology is, but what else is happening with the horse? So are there any areas you can identify that are painful how do you measure pain in a horse? This is really, really hard. I can palpate a person and say, does that hurt? And they go, ouch, yes. And if you press hard enough, you know, they'll probably give a little yelp. Um, the difference with the horse is some horses are very, very stoic. They may show pain, excuse me, pain behaviors early or not until it's actually really hurting them quite a lot. So the palpation skills are very important to look at. Are the muscles contracting or fasciculating around different areas? Does the horse bear away from the palpation? Or obviously if it's very painful, collapse underneath your fingers, in other words, bend a hind leg or actually even turn around to bite you or kick you. So it's measuring the level of the horse's pain and that's a very difficult thing across both uh, the veterinary medical side and the physiotherapy side. We're looking at performance or loss of function. So obviously is the horse lame and how can we measure that? And Dr. Rashmi talked about that last week and we've also got some wonderful tools here at the McPhail Centre which I'll talk about. So it's looking at the whole horse. So what happens with the forelimb or the neck and the back when there's a hind limb lameness, especially in chronic disorders. It's very common that horses with chronic lamenesses in their limbs can also have primary or secondary back problems. A lameness causes a change in motion throughout the whole horse, not just in that leg. So it's very, very um, important that um, the whole horse is looked at in that sense. So then it's looking at what techniques can we use to help along with the medical management to reduce pain. Um, and there's many forms of electrotherapy which is different 
um, devices that cause different currents through the horse that actually help with reduce pain as well as manual techniques. Then it's trying to improve the movement and actually restore normal muscle contractions. If the horse has had a lameness or a problem in, in a limb joint for example, even muscles higher up throughout the horse's body like the hindquarter muscles or the shoulder muscles actually atrophy or reduce in size and some actually hypertrophy or increase or become overactive in size. Size. So it's assessing all of these um, muscles and, and movement patterns. It's important when your horse is going through the rehabilitation process, not only from the therapist's point of view, but from your perspective and the veterinarian's point of view, is constantly to reassess the situation. Are we getting any improvement or on a day-to-day -day basis, is the horse having a bad day? And then looking at how you may assess that. From my perspective here in the research centre, we're looking at very much objective measures and so it's a black or white, yes or no, it's getting better or not. And we look at things like range of motion, muscle bulk we can measure with ultrasonography, symmetry of muscle, we've got a pain scoring system. And then we also can look at these kinematic and kinetic analysis. And what that means is kinematic is how the horse moves, what angles or range of motion, and kinetic is the forces that go through the horse or how they impact the ground when they land. And a lame horse will be different than a sound horse. Whoops, I've just started my arrow. And as I said, the key thing is a team effort working with the veterinarian's pathoanatomical diagnosis and the veterinarian monitoring whatever the, the pathology and the condition is. And also in conjunction with whatever medication or medical management the horse is actually undergoing at the time. I'll just touch on this just very, very briefly. The person sitting aboard is a big part of the whole horse's rehabilitation process. You have a massive impact on the type of work the horse does. You impact the horse on the weight you're putting down through the horse, whether it be in the limbs or the back itself. And you and the horse are actually part of each other. In other words, you're both the actual athlete. And so it's important to know that as a rider, you actually can impact the horse and you actually may or may not be part of the horse's problem. Just like some horses are asymmetrical, most of us are asymmetrical. So we're putting through the horse different forces depending on the individual rider. If we just gloss over some of the different techniques, we don't have time to completely describe every single technique and there are many, 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 many treatment techniques and assessment techniques. Some of the things we'll touch on briefly are those that the therapist themselves will actually manually um, perform with the horse. The top left photo here is actually um, I'm performing an assessment and treatment so I'm actually looking at deep palpation through the horse's hindquarter musculature and the muscles in the horse's hindquarter are very very deep you're looking at you know a good 20 to 30 centimeters of depth so you can't actually get to the really deep muscles to see if there's been muscle tearing or strain and that's where things like ultrasonography come in very ha helpful Soft tissue treatments are very, very useful and this could be just general massage or techniques like myofascial release or trigger point therapy, etc. The horse has got massive muscles and obviously that can have a big impact whether they're over contractile or in spasm or if the muscles actually aren't firing very well or aren't working very well. This technique here in the center is actually an osteopathic technique and this is treating the horse under sedation. So sometimes there are conditions or injuries where the horse is often either one, too painful to let you to palpate and treat them and two, that they're very deep chronic problems and especially with spinal disorders and this was a horse that actually was in a trailer accident where the trailer flipped over and the horse actually had whiplash um, so it had a lot of excessive um, muscle spasm of its neck joints, it didn't have a fracture at all so obviously it had uh, radiographs and so forth taken so this is just gently t treating the horse gently elongating its neck and joints, moving it through range so that it allows the joints to move and mobilize and not actually stiffen and become a chronic problem. We can also use joint mobilizations as described in this picture here where I'm actually mobilizing one of the individual vertebrae in the neck of the horse if there has been any change in the integrity of the joint. In other words, the joint is stiff, it's not moving properly. 
neck arthritis or degenerative joint problems in horses necks is not uncommon especially in the lower neck here in many horses as I described like the eventing horse or horses that are held in a fairly flexed position just like us they can get joint problems and also disc problems and nerve problems so nerve entrapments and so forth other forms of therapy which is very very useful which I'll describe at length um, in the second part of the lecture is exercise based therapy. We can't tell a horse to lift its leg up in the air and hold it there for 10 seconds like we can a person or stretch a certain way. The horse doesn't lie down for us to treat them so often we have to use treats to encourage a horse to move their head and neck in a posture and also then you can lift a leg like I have here to try to get the back to lift and also engage those tummy muscles and we'll go through some more of these exercises later on in the lecture. Another very useful tool is actually facilitating different muscle contractions and this is a horse uh, that had pelvic asymmetry in its muscle control and I'll talk about this in I think the next slide or two and this is using taping techniques and this is a type of tape called kinesio tape and because the tape is porous um, it sticks quite well and the horse can sweat through it. Obviously it, the horse's coat needs to be short. Other forms of treatment is electrotherapy and this is a little laser device which I'll talk about in a moment which helps with wound healing. So there's many many facets of rehabilitation and treatment that are available and out there now uh, to complement the veterinary care. Manual therapy, you can see this horse here is looking rather happy with himself, a big yawn. One of the things that manual therapy does which it can be either mobilization of specific joints or soft tissue techniques is scientifically we know that both soft tissue massage and manipulation techniques and mobilization techniques actually causes centrally effect, central effects and what I mean by that is the central nervous system or the brain actually produces hormones called opioids and that's released into the horse's bloodstream which are pain relieving natural agents so many forms of manual therapy actually get pain relief and in this setting at the last Olympics, this was one of our eventing horses, obviously you can't use drugs. So a lot of manual therapy is very, very useful in helping relieve the horse's discomfort, especially in eventing after the cross-country phase and get them through the next trot up. Other forms of, of manual therapy you'll see here, this is a horse, it's a dressage horse, lots of muscles, I think I was probably probably fatigued after treating this horse, um, and you can re really get in quite deep into the muscles and, the, and pick up minor problems and also treat them from a soft tissue perspective so that you're alleviating muscle spasm, muscle fasciculation and providing the horse with some pain relief. It's why when you get a massage as a human you come out and you feel like you're floating on clouds and you're nice and relaxed because you've got all of those happy hormones flying around in your body. The picture on the right is actually looking at a specific mobilization technique down through a particular vertebral body here in the thoracic spine looking at mobilizing one or more vertebrae next to each other and we know that those joint motions cause an increase in the uh, nutrition supply of the joint because you're actually moving the fluid around in the joint, the synovial fluid and you're actually creating a gliding effect which actually mobilizes the tissues so the ligaments and the structures around the joint. This also has a reflexive response in the spinal cord that actually relaxes the muscles around the actual joints and allow them to move more effective along with the effects on the central nervous system with that hormone that opioid release so you get a double whammy effect with using both your soft tissue and your joint mobilization techniques these mobilization techniques are really really useful in the distal limb a lot of our horses, your general riding horses, your quarter horses, uh, your x-race horses have a lot of degenerative changes or arthritis in their distal joints as I mentioned and this is a very specific technique mobilizing down through the joint that actually sits underneath 
the coronet band area P23 or the coffin joint and the coffin joint moves in all planes and it's almost like if you wiggle the base of your thumb around and the joints almost shaped somewhat like the seat of a saddle so it's different curvatures in different directions which allows the horse to move its foot in different um, directions so that it can actually maneuver over the ground or uneven surfaces and so we use as a physio or an osteopath or chiropractic different mobilization or manipulation techniques um, techniques to actually free up that joint a little bit to allow more motion in that joint and often you'll have restrictions in different planes of movement patterns. I mentioned electrotherapy. Electrotherapy is a very useful adjunct to your ma manual therapies. Um, you have to be very careful what is advertised as this machine will fix all out there. I obviously come from a very evidence-based practice and can fill you in on a little bit of, of information that we have on the effects on horses. We know that laser is very, very useful and this is lasering a, a torn um, side of the, the, the horse's mouth after the cross-country phase, an open wound. Laser is excellent and has loads of evidence for wound healing. It's used extensively in humans. It helps increase the um, amount of the base cells that are lays, laid down for healing, the granular matrix, and it accelerates healing. Laser stands for light amplified stimulated emission of radiation. So it's a certain very fine spectrum in the light spectrum. Um, true laser is, is not just the red light you see. Um, with some machines. That's a different spectrum. One word of warning with using laser in horses and especially in the distal limbs is these little devices vary in their intensity and their frequencies and there are some little clinical reports so you have to be careful getting good advice from your veterinarian and also the physiotherapist is you, that you can overstimulate the granular matrix and actually get excessive proud flesh and we know how hard that is to deal with in, within the limb injuries often so you just have to be careful and it's lasering it at the right time to accelerate those cells laying down but not to make them excessive so there are always with any treatment modality contraindications and precautions so it really tends on depends on the type of injury you have and is this form of treatment appropriate or is it having any effect at all. On the horse on the right you'll see it's got numerous modalities. This was an eventing horse that had really a lot of chronic spine problems so multiple sites down through its back where it had different forms of pathology through from overriding dorsal spinous process or kissing spines and also had some facet joint pathology so the joints in between each vertebrae had a, a ligament injury here on the top of its pelvis the dorsal sacroiliac ligament so it had multiple issues but it was competing at very high level so here we're looking at using a TENS machine and that's what this little electrode here is and what it does it, it supplies a, an electrical current that stimulates the nerves and depending on the frequency you can also get a little muscle contraction and we know scientifically that TENS also acts like acupuncture in that it also stimulates those special little hormones in your brain called opioids and there's a couple of different type of opioids so so far we know that manual therapy and soft tissue and joint mobilization and some forms of electrotherapy actually provide really quite adequate pain relief the hard part is like with people it varies from person to person it varies from horse to horse in that the amount of opioid release varies so here I'm looking at lasering some trigger points or acupuncture points at the same time as the horse has actually got some um, electrotherapy or TENS the horse on the left here now uh, is actually um, being treated for some muscle soreness and some muscle spasm because of some saddle injury and when I say saddle injury um, this is actually another horse at Olympic level but the horse had lost some weight in traveling from Australia to Beijing and change of climate so the saddle now wasn't perfectly fitting and this is a major problem with a lot of our horses is saddle fit which I don't have time to go into but here it's got some pulsed electromagnetic 
electromagnetic field therapy, which we know in the literature is actually very good for increasing circulation. So increased circulation means increased blood flow, increasing the good nutrients to the muscle, and also flushing out the, the inflammatory products. Um, obviously, these horses at this level weren't allowed to take any medication, so anything you can use that will accelerate the healing is obviously important across all of our horses. One thing that is p potentially not utilized enough on a day-to-day -day basis with our riding and our competition horses is an appropriate warm-down period, or you don't just stop the horse after you've jumped a few fences or gone around you know your barrel racing and jump off and shove it into the stable if you're at the gym you don't just immediately stop after running on the treadmill you'll walk for a while you do some stretching and if you're feeling any twinges anywhere you may ice it when you go home cryotherapy or cold therapy has actually probably got the most evidence that in horses um, in the literature of having an effect what ice does is basically slows down the circulation or slows down the inflammatory reaction after an injury I always laugh in winter in Michigan I just say we'll stick them outside in the snowy paddock but um, obviously it's particular places to ice and the horse here on the left this is actually coming in after the cross-country phase this is my other job is icing and freezing my hands off there is uh, big jet fans here that have icy water streaming out. If you want to cool a horse effectively, if you've gone on an endurance ride, if you've gone on a big trail ride, if you've just worked the horse very, very hard and you're upping its work level, you will get a lot of heat in those muscles. And it's best if you can cool them as quick as possible. And the best way to do that is slushy iced water on with a sponge, leave it for only not even five seconds and scrape it off. If you leave the water on there, it actually traps the heat between the hair and the skin and the water. So you need to wash and scrape, wash and scrape, wash and scrape. Here again is the horse on the right hand side with welly boots on. Well, what it's doing is actually standing in slushy ice water up to its carpus or its knee. Now there are many, many ice boots on the market. A lot of them are very, very good. You do have to be careful that there's not a dry interface between the slushy water or the cold and the horse's leg. If the hair is dry, it will trap the heat inside the horse's leg and the heat will warm the water and not the water cooling the leg, if that makes sense. So the best ice we know is that slushy ice, you can bandage it on or put it in a, an elastic tube, a bandage which is called tubey grip, and basically circulating water and ice is the best. Now as we know here in Michigan the horse can stand out in ice and snow all winter and not freeze its feet off and that's because they have a very specialized circulation system below their knee. Elsewhere in the body the horse you cannot leave ice on it for long periods of time. If you ice yourself or you've been advised, advised to ice yourself at all, you'll know that you've been told between 10 and 20 minutes, 20 minutes max. Now what happens with us and horses, other body parts other than their limbs, is once the ice has been on or the c cooling agent has been on for a period of time, their body and our body says, oh my goodness, you are freezing me, my muscle is going to die, and it actually ru rushes more blood to the area. So you actually get vasodilation and not vasoconstriction. And so that's why when you ice a horse anywhere other than their distal limbs, max 20 minutes on, and then you would take it off for at least 20 minutes and then re-ice it. And what we're doing here, this is the horse that had all of that back pain that we're treating before it competed. And you'll see up here is a towel. An easy way to ice a horse's back or hindquarter is you wet a towel, saturate it, and put it in the freezer. So it'll end up with ice lumps all over it. Crush ice, fold the towel with crushed ice. The ice needs to be at the temperature that it's at that melting stage. So then you can actually ice the horse's back or neck or hindquarter or wherever you feel that there is an injury. Especially if you've got an acute muscle tear, 
the quicker you can ice it the better to stop the inflammation process and slow down the bleeding within the muscle and you really need to do that for the first 72 hours before you're sure that everything is starting to clot and heal and, and no heat applied in that first 72 hours. I'll touch on this briefly and I mentioned this earlier is taping techniques. Taping is an amazing way of well getting something into a position as you'll see the rider on the on the left here taping uh, her back into a, a, a posture that is perfect riding position posture. So in people in sports you would have seen at the last Olympics those that watched other sports and especially those that watched the women's volleyball um, in, the, in the outdoor beach volleyball you would have seen a lot of athletes with different colored tape on their skin. Uh, and what that does is this special tape when placed over muscles in a certain direction you can actually facilitate muscle activity and there's some nice research out on this now and this tape is called kinesio tape and it came out of Japan K-I-N-E-S-I-O kinesio tape and so you can actually get more muscle activity in areas that you desire like here on the horse on the right this muscle that it's coming over top of is part of the gluteals but also a very important muscle which stabilizes the whole limb of the horse which is called biceps femoris. We're also over another muscle here tensor fascia lata which comes down onto the stifle and this is very important in any horses that have had hock stifle or pelvic or sacroiliac joint problems and these muscles are often affected so in the rehabilitation process we use specific taping techniques so that the horse gets more muscle activity stabilizes the, the limb better and has more power on the limb so strengthens around the pathology if you're weak around an area or a joint that's got pathology the joint control will be much worse and there'll be a repeti repetitive cycle of pain and inflammation and further degenerative changes. Here we've actually also got the tape on some of the tummy muscles and we'll talk about core stability shortly but we all know for human back pain that your tummy strength is really vital in your rehabilitation process because our tummy muscles actually come all the way up and there's a special tummy muscle called transverse abdominis and they actually attach onto the vertebrae in the lumbar spine and these are really really important in, in stabilizing the horse's body so that their limbs can work powerfully and then you get that nice upward forward movement. Another device so to speak that we use is TheraBand and this is an elasticy band that's rubberized that actually rides over the skin and pulls on the hair a little bit so it gives the horse body awareness and we can use that in different parts of the horse's body you'll see a picture later where we actually place it around the whole hind quarter and attach it to the girth and that gives the horse awareness of where its body is just like us, some people have better wear a body awareness than others. Some are really agile, really stable, really strong and really flexible and others aren't. Similar with horses there's a large variation. So it's also looking at what is possible and the potential of your individual horse whether it be following an injury or from a performance enhancement perspective. So when we look at rehabilitation and keeping your horse sound and progressing through the levels and I said that's whether it be that you're an endurance rider or a barrel racer, dressage, show jumping, reining, whatever that is, it's looking at the principles of conditioning which are really really important. What I want you to think about is what would you do if you from scratch are going to start to train to run a marathon? First of all you, you're going to start by just running around the block. You're going to think about what surface you're going to run around the block on. Are you going to run on grass? Are you going to run on deep sand? Are you going to run on the tarmac road? Because each of those surfaces will have different impact up through the soft tissues and the joints. So you need to consider the environmental factors. What is important is the depth of the arena or the surface and the firmness of the arena or the surface or wherever you're actually out trail riding or working. It's important to have variation between your surfaces. Anything that's loaded in the same fashion over and over and over again can have detrimental effects on your horse. 
So do you always work in the arena or sometimes do you work on the grass or do you work on a m more firmer surface? If you think if you've sprained your ankle and you go to Lake Michigan or if you're in Australia you, you go down to the beach and you want to start running again. It's a soft tissue injury, so it's a ligament injury. So is that going to be worse running in the deep sand where it's less stable, there's more chance of your ankle rolling over? Yes, of course. So you might start on the firmer surface and then graduate to softer surfaces. But if you've just had a joint injury in your ankle and the cartilage has been disrupted and or you're recovering from, say, an arthroscopic surgery or if you're the horse, the, the veterinarian has injected the joint and the, you're on medication but the horse is still recovering, you may not want hard surfaces. You may want that in-between surface that offers a bit of cushioning. So it's very important to talk to your veterinarian and your therapist and work out your conditioning progr program related to the s surface factors, which are very, very important. Obviously time, which we'll talk about of work as well. I touched on this, but tack is very important important in the process of rehabilitation or coming up through your levels of competition and we'll look at one device that we can measure tack fit but loads of horses have problems with poor fitting tack and you're just making the scenario worse unless you address that very much looking at when you're rehabilitating is is how you can get the horse very sport specific fit again so your race horse is not going to just start well in some cases they do bring them back into work too quickly but you're not going to start by take them out of the stable they've been on three months box rest and you're not going to start by a gallop work you're going to be careful you're going to do some long walk trot graduate up through the levels your dressage horse it's been out for a month you're not going to go in the arena and work for half an hour on doing canter pirouettes and flying changes you're going to graduate the horse's musculoskeletal system back into training slowly over time and this is especially in injury prevention a lot of horses injuries in my opinion is people pushing up through the levels of whatever work too quickly or forgetting that the horse has been on holidays or you've been ill for a month and the horse can't just come straight back out and s stay at the level it previously was and so just think about the principles you would apply if you were going to do a particular sport either from scratch or how you would graduate that program so these principles um, of conditioning involve the warm-up period. So think about, I'm going to ride my horse, uh, my vet said now I can step up my training to 15 minutes in the saddle. The first five minutes you're actually going to be gradually warming up. The second five minutes you're going to be trying to get some quality work or conditioning. And then the last five minutes is tapering back down. The hardest thing I've found for riders to to um, stay um, in tune with is time. I always get riders, even if it's walking the horse in hand or actually it's now riding and conditioning the horse, is to set your stopwatch. You will say, okay, you've got to do 20 minutes and all of a sudden you look down and you've been on the horse for 35 minutes and then the next day the leg is now swollen or the horse is actually unsound or that the horse has actually got a lot of muscle spasm. So really rigidly stick to your time zones that you've been structured. A useful way to, to do this is if you're increasing the workload is to, to split it, if you've got time, to split it at either end of the day. and that's what a lot of runners will do that are doing long distance training or a lot of strength training. You don't strengthen in the gym every single muscle in your whole body every workout. You may in the morning do your, your arms, in the afternoon your legs or if you're running you might split the miles that you're running into different parts of the day or the week and allow the recovery time and the muscles to adapt. So it's really graduating your exercise program and writing out a program. The other key thing across the board, and I know that Dr. Rashmi talked about this, is you need to evaluate your horse regularly. Most of us go out to the stable or the paddock, pull the horse in, brush the horse, tack up, jump on, ride, and then you think, oh, something's wrong. 
So it's regularly running your hands over all the limbs. Is there any new areas where there seems like there's a swelling? Um, you know, what do your feet look like? Is my tack now fitting? And what I get my clients to do, and I know a lot of them are elite clients, but even the, the everyday rider is to pop your horse on a lunge once a week just to make sure it looks the same. Is it sound and is it improving? Just like you and I, some mornings I get out of bed and I really don't feel like running and other days you have a brilliant run. So remember that a horse will have good days and bad days and when they're not feeling right, stop. Don't push them through it. Is there a reason why? I mean, it's easy to always blame the horse for misbehavior, but sometimes that misbehavior or resistance may be that something something is not right, and especially during rehabilitating an injury. The horse can't tell us when it first hurts. A human can, so you can stop what you're doing and go back down a step. So it's very important to for regular re-evaluation from your veterinarian and your therapist, and then adjust your program accordingly. An area of interest um, in the human field, which is also an area of interest in the animal field or the horse sports, is DOMS. And what's that, what that is, is delayed onset muscle soreness. We all know you go to the gym, you work out for the first time, or you go for a run. The next day you feel a bit stiff. The second day you're like hurting like crazy. And you've got that muscle pain, all over muscle pain. And this is actually low level muscle trauma or micro trauma because you've actually stressed your body beyond its limits. Horses also can get this condition and it's just this global muscle soreness. A key area where horses often get this is say in eventing. You've had the eventer that's just gone cross country, um, it's pushed itself to its limit, it's gone flat chat torn around a course have some person bouncing up and down on its back and it often has this global muscle soreness. We know with DOMS in the human literature that the best thing to try to slow that down because it's an inflammatory reaction in the body is icing. So that's why we want that icing as quick as possible and to keep the horse actually moving so that then the next day when it has to show jump that it's actually able to. And a lot of the horses in the eventing world are very sore after the, after the cross country. And then their, their show jumping is, is um, affected by that. Another um, reason why horses just get globally muscle sore is actually from travel. And especially the horses that travel long distances. You think about traveling from Michigan down to Florida for, for a competition and the horses stood on the lorry for, or the truck or whatever you call it here um, for, for a couple of days. And it's their postural muscles. If you stand in a moving vehicle on a bus, you're always adjusting to, to not falling over. So a lot of these horses come off their, their trailering or their, their, their trucking, and they'll actually be generally sore for a few days, especially in their postural muscles. So please consider that when you're traveling horses long distances to getting them off and giving them a rest and walking around. Obviously, the respiratory system is compromised with a horse unable to put its head down as well so it is important to get them off the vehicle. So just in summary, graduate your work program, write it out, avoid this weekend warrior syndrome where possible, you know the horse is in the stable or in the paddock, you get it out in the weekend, you go hard riding all weekend and then you put it back in the stable. I did that myself this weekend. I went to the gym, worked out like a demon, hadn't been for a month or so, and then was really, really sore, especially today. Uh, and that's not great for your body. You know, you have microtrauma, you have some scar tissue form, and, y and you can get repetitive strain injury from this weekend warrior type syndrome. Um, and you won't do your horse any benefit at all. Cross training is a really key thing. Please don't just do your sporting event. You don't just go in and go around the barrels every day. You don't go in and just go over jumps every day. You don't go and just do your dressage workout. If we, you would, were training for gymnastics or if you were training for a running event or a swimming event, you don't just do that activity. You go to the gym, you do stretching, you do core exercises, you do yoga, you do cardiovascular and you do strength training. So think of cross training as all of those things for your horse and it'll make them happier. It gives them a change in environment 
it, it just it really develops their muscle system as a whole and their flexibility and we'll talk about some techniques to do that. Be aware that your training surface and environment may be very different than your competition environment as well as the climate. I've had numerous cases in the past referred from veterinarians uh, where they've had tendon or ligament or joint injuries and really what happened was they went to a competition and the surface was either a lot deeper or a lot harder and the horses muscles, ligaments, tendons and joint structures weren't adapted for that. It's like that you go for a big run on the road and you get which is a very lay term shin splints because you've overloaded the concussive forces through the leg all of a sudden you go running on the beach in the deep sand and your Achilles tendon is screaming at you so think about adapting your horse to wherever your condition uh, are going to be in the um, competition environment now I want to just briefly touch on some some of the research here we're doing at the MacPhail Centre. We have some very, very state-of-the-art um, um, evaluation equipment which we'll go through some examples and this is a motion analysis system. We use force plates, EMG systems and other very um, specialised equipment like these rain tension sensors to measure how much force is going through the rain and through the bit to the horse's mouth. As I mentioned, saddle pressure or effects of, of poorly fitting saddles is really, really important um, in, in relation to back pain. And we have this very unique device here, which is this pressure mat here that measures the forces going through the saddle. And this is just attached for the data collection. And you get this feed, feed uh, out of this map of, of, of the shape and the pressure. And the different colors uh, relate to the amount of pressures in each of the tiny little sensors. So there's thousands of little sensors underneath the saddle as well. So we can look at if the rider's symmetrical, we can look at if the saddle is fitting the horse and obviously not all horses are symmetrical or very few are totally symmetrical and we can look at the effect of individual saddles on each horse and also the effect of saddle pads. This is what you don't want to see um, is this here area here is completely necrosed or um, wasted away so the muscle has died under the back panel of the saddle and that muscle may never ever come back and this horse has got chronic back pain and so your saddles can really cause a lot of problems so the key thing for rehabilitation here is changing your saddle and getting an appropriately flocked saddle that's going to now help fill this area or an appropriate pad that will help fill this area as well and in the research one of the 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 padding system or the saddle blanket systems that seems to work the best and is w most um, amenable is actually your sheepskin. And so having a well fitted saddle by a professional saddle fitter on the horse is the best way of well, avoiding and helping fix these scenarios. As Dr. Rashmir mentioned last week, we have a special system here at McPhail which is called motion analysis. And these cameras here pick up reflections from these little markers and this horse has actually got a little lycra suit on but it's also got some of the markers stuck on the different joints. So what happens is the horse trots or canters or does a maneuver in front of these cameras and then with a bit of work from some of our data analysis people we get a stick figure. So you join together basically all of these dots then what we can do is actually design so we join the horse's limbs together and this could be analyzing a lame horse or an analyzing a horse as it's going through a rehabilitation process. We then can recreate the horse and we can actually measure joint motions, we can also measure forces through joints when the horse lands on the force plate and if I'll just get Amanda to play that first video for me you'll see the horse will actually um, canter past and you can actually measure um, the stride length, the stance phase and the swing phase, in other words when the foot's on the ground and when it's off the ground and how the back is moving and you can see here, you can look at the horse um, from all different angles and sides. We just created the background. You can actually just have a smooth background. Um, and I'll just run that through again. And so this is the type of technology that they use to make animated films. So it's motion analysis. So we're very lucky at the McPhail Centre to be able to analyse our horses during the rehabilitation process. Okay, if we just switch back to the presentation.
it just takes a second everybody okay here's another example of how we analyze during the rehabilitation process and the picture on the left you'll see a stick figure of the horse and for those that you know a little bit about dressage this is a canter pirouette in other words it's cantering on the spot where its back feet make a tiny circle and its front legs and body move around that in 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 this case in the left direction and if I can just get you to play that video there Amanda of the horse on the right is going to come across the squares that are in the ground are actually force plates so they measure the amount of force that actually go down through the horse's legs and as they hit the force plate you see the line come up so we can measure if a horse is putting less or more loading through one or more limbs to know whether the horse is recovering adequately because it should be if they're trotting in a straight line for example even through all of the limbs if we look at this horse again come over it's actually the outside hind limb that actually takes a lot of the stress in the canter pirouette and you'll see when that hits the force plate there is actually a very large arrow and a big circle um, showing the forces so that's some gait analysis techniques and technology that we have to have here at the McPhail Center Okay, now we're quickly going to go on to, sorry I've taken a lot longer than I thought I would, we're going to look at some active exercise uh, treatment techniques that you can do at home with your horses. And some of these techniques um, are very useful in rehabilitating horses after they've had limb injuries, but as well as back injuries. Now, the picture on the left are these little proprioceptive tactile devices and they actually only weigh 50 grams so they're very light, uh, light so it's not like putting a weight on a horse's leg it's very very different and it's just a little spur strap with little jangly devices that basically tickle the horse's uh, coronet band and it makes them they lift they lift their legs up a lot higher and we'll I'll show you in a video shortly the one on the right here is actually trotting up and this is this theraband around the hind quarter here so we've looked at some studies on looking at how the horse moves and the forces that they put through the body so kinetics and kinematics of the limbs and how they habituate to these devices over time and we've actually published already two papers on this and so we have some nice results showing that yes you can change and we'll get Amanda to, to start this video and this is the horse without any of the devices just trotting past and then we'll play the second video directly after that and that's with the little proprioceptive stimulation devices on the hind limbs so you'll see this horse's gait it's fairly low flight path of its hind limbs it's just trotting up it's got average amount of back movement and then when we go to the next video it's actually got the little proprioceptive device devices around its pastern area that are just loosely connected and that makes actually a much more flexion range or higher movement of the stifle the hock and also the hip area so during rehabilitation of horses after they've had uh, hock problems or stifle problems or even um, pelvic problems like sacroiliac disease it makes the muscles work a lot harder and you can see there how much more flexion through the joints the horse has it also has a greater stride length so in other words it's reaching underneath more so it's a nice tool you have to be very careful with it it's not suited for every horse and you really need to get advice from your veterinarian we can go back to the presentation there Amanda um, you get advice from your veterinarian and, and, and therapist if it's appropriate for that particular horse at that particular stage it can be very useful to use this during um, your training as well if you find your horse has a low flight path or those horses like that they call daisy cutters that basically skim or uh, you know low flight path through the ground um, but it is very specific to each individual horse and it's being sure that one it's appropriate and two that it's not causing more force through different joints so it's very very horse specific some exercises which we find extremely useful in all scenarios of rehabilitation and performance enhancement is dynamic stability exercises or how to activate your horse's core and the core in the horse is the abdominal area and the thoracic sling area this is a book here that uh, Dr. Clayton and I published a couple of years ago which describes the exercises in detail along with a DVD but I'd just like to show you some of those exercises here today so what we're looking at is how we can affect mobility 
stability and strength so overall effect on soundness this is looking at activating some of the muscles that stabilize or are the postural muscles ballistic muscles are the big muscles that drive the horse for example galloping so the big hind quarter muscles or the big muscles as they land that brace themselves the postural muscles are these preparatory muscles so they're contracting all the time to hold the body of the horse in a stable environment so that the big muscles can work very hard and some of these muscles as I said are the abdominal area these muscles that that eventing horse had torn the serratus ventralis group some of the small muscles in the neck the epaxial just means the little muscles that are on the top side deep to the big muscles and the pelvic stabilizing muscles Here's an example of a couple of exercises. The horse on the left, I'm actually lifting the hind leg and it's actually having a stretching effect of some of these big hamstring muscles and also this important biceps femoris muscle. Interestingly, the horse is actually cheating. The horse is very unique in that the hind quarter muscles also attach into the long back muscles which go all the way up into the horse's neck. So he's taking the back muscles off stretch by lifting his head up in the air and to the side. The horse on the right is doing a dynamic exercise whereby it's bending its whole body following a bait or a carrot. What it's got to do though is stabilize through its pelvis, really use its tummy muscles to get in that position and to stay in that position. And we've done studies looking at using motion analysis and ultrasonography over time to see what effects of re the repeated exercises over six months do to some horses. Some of the exercises that we use is using a baited stretch or carrot stretch so you're getting the horse to bring its nose between its legs around to the side keeping the nose low if you have the nose go too high the horse sometimes can extend their back which you don't want you can see how much muscle activation you have here through the abdominal muscles and the pelvic stabilizing muscles The three different positions we often use for the neck exercises are chin to chest, which mainly is looking at affecting the upper cervical spine, chin between the carpus or the knee, which is the upper and mid, and chin between the fetlock, which is actually mid and lower. This horse actually has osteoarthritis in its mid neck and is actually not bending its mid neck as well. The reason why we look at the di these different exercises and where the movement takes place is there's been a lot of studies looking at which joint moves where and we know that the upper cervical spine here is most of your flexion extension and your mid cervical spine is a there's a lot of um, lateral flexion and rotation. And so this is just a graph to show you whereabouts in the horse's body that most of the flexion extension takes place. Here's an example of horse, two horses that do the exercise completely differently. S they get to a similar finish position. So basically underneath that elbow area where their nose is level. But this horse is not moving its neck at all. It's totally s straight here and it's doing most of its bending in the upper cervical spine but where it's getting most of its movement from is in the lower back and pelvis whereas this horse has got a more normal pattern of flexion and this horse has actually got quite severe degenerative changes in its neck which further went on further to um, radiographs and so forth uh, to diagnose this so for this horse doing some of the extreme exercises may aggravate some of the joints whereas some of the low long positions will actually help mobilize the horse's back this is two horses doing the exercises very very differently so every horse is different and this is the graph showing how much movement takes place through the horse's back this is a young horse on the right he's very flexible through his neck and you can see the amount of curvature coming down through his back and he's very stable this is an older horse the one that's got some arthritic changes can you see that tendon that's sticking out here because he's trying to get there but he's so stiff in his neck he can't he's got nowhere near as much lateral bend and he's leaning over to the side if you look at the angle of his body compared to the other horse he's virtually leaning over to the side to get there so it's looking at your horse how they perform the activity and then addressing the exercises appropriately 
the study that we did used that motion analysis system where these are the shiny dots that are on the horse that what the cameras pick up. So they did these exercises every day, five days a week. They performed the exercises five times each exercise and we measured how far their body could move every month for six month, months. And this is the little picture here of the stick figure that we got from that study. And I'll just get Amanda to play that video again. And this is going to show you what the stick figure of the horse during the lateral bending motion uh, following a carrot. And we measured basically every joint angle down through the horse at the start of the study period and then every month through the study. And what we found was that over time, especially in the first month, the horse increased significantly in its range of motion across all of horses and these horses were riding school horses that were on holidays and not doing any other activity and they're mostly in their late teens so that's a very nice positive result uh, okay we can go on with the presentation after that period of about one month they plateaued a little bit in that their range of motion just slowly increased a little bit more but what did increase was the muscle development and what we did was measure that with ultrasonography and we measured some of those core stabilizing muscles which included the abdominal muscles so your external and internal oblique and also this really important one the transverse abdominus muscles and what we found is over time these abdominal muscles and the deep spinal muscles increase in size. In other words, they get stronger and, and, and enlarged over time, which is great. So we know that these simple exercises on a daily basis can really help your horse's mobility, stability and strength. Here's another exercise which is just a rounding response and we've only got a few more slides to go for those of you that are hanging on for the finish. Um, and all we're doing is by placing pressure over the horse's hind quarter in the center you actually get the horse to lift up through their stomach and flex here at the lumbar sacral area so one hand is applying pressure on the, the caudal part or the back part of of the vertebral bodies from the highest point of the rump down to the tail and the other hand is doing a rounding response which is central pressure under the sternum area or under where the girth goes. You'll see that these lines here represent the same line on each wall. If you look at the difference between the one on the left and the starting position, if you look at the gap here under the curve of the, the line in the horse's back, you can see how far the horse actually really lifts its back and flexes its back purely using the abdominal musculature and the thoracic sling. So these are like the horse doing sit-ups. So we go to the gym and we do sit-ups and we do Pilates. So this is equivalent to doing those exercises just statically. Now if your horse is on box rest or stable rest from an injury, these exercises are perfect. You're not loading the limbs, you're not loading the joints, but you're keeping this horse strong, fit and not losing that muscle tone you get with bed rest bed rest. So these exercises are excellent to do when your horse is on, on stable rest or as just like your Pilates while you're in training. These are destabilizing exercises which are a little bit hard to describe but basically by picking up a front leg and pushing the weight back of the horse they really have to shift a lot of weight back and they actually flex through their spine and really strengthen their hindquarter muscles and so if you'd like to see more of these techniques um, please go ahead and obviously get hold of the book um, you can do that through Sports Horse Publications which is just www.sportshorsepublications or we can chat about it at the end the other area you can facilitate muscle contractions just by a gentle tail pull so by putting the horse off balance you can see here that the muscles you can see contracting through the hindquarter so there's some very simple exercises you can, you can use if your horse is on stable rest and to help strengthen them and even up their muscle activity from left to right so that when they're back moving again they're more balanced oh take, take a deep breath now and so these exercises we know help strengthen and help mobilize joints and ultimately give the horse more dynamic stability so that core strength and we have found these exercises to be very very useful in rehabilitation after injury but also to prevent injury and a big thing with performance enhancement and this can be across all sports
and I think then we've got our last slide is I, I believe the rehabilitation over time can equal and help soundness obviously makes the horse happy and riders happy and then hopefully a successful outcome at whatever level you're working at so please go ahead and, and um, I will have a look at the question um, page. I'd like to thank everyone that obviously has helped me out with a lot of this research at the McPhail Centre and also for, for Nicole and, and Anne for, for filtering the questions which I've tried not to look at on the way. I'll just see if there's anything else. Um, maybe Anne and, and um, Nicole can let me know if there's something I need to answer. Um, as far as starting a mature age, uh, the question is do you encourage them to start at a mature age? In the literature um, there is actually no real evidence to say that the age of commencement um, affects the performance and the outcome and there's a mixed result. I think you just have to err on the side of caution. Uh, while the horse is still actively growing or gr going through growth spurts, you, you have to back off how much work you're doing. It depends on the type of job you want the horse to do. Um, in racing, for example, the type of injury varies uh, depending on the stage that they actually commence racing, although the amount of injury across ages doesn't vary that much. Um, so it really depends, I think, as well. Um, so barrel, um, the age and the job of the horse. I don't know if that answered your question or not, um, um, Joe. And uh, barrel race horse. Oh, good barrel race horse going strong. Well, a lot of a lot of horses, you know, really can compete well into their twenties, um, even at very very top level. It really is individual variation, just like with people. A lot of the individual variation would be related to um, conformation, um, the type of sport the horse is doing, and obviously your training and the medical and the veterinary care. Uh, so it does vary um, across horses and horse sports. Okay, if there's no other questions, unless I've missed something. Yeah, as far as the, the source for, for learning es equine massage techniques, there's a very good group, actually Nicole can, can put you in contact with the group here in the US, um, and it's called equine Equ Equinology. Sorry, I've gone all sorts suddenly t tongue tied. Um, if you just look up Equinology um, on the website, they run a series of courses uh, to learn how to be massage therapists, uh, and they're very, very uh, highly professional. Um, I actually teach um, occasionally on that course. Um, it's also taught by a lot of veterinarians and also very established people. They cover cover saddle fitting as well as uh, from a nutritional perspective. Um, et cetera, et cetera. There is another organization down in Florida that I also teach at, which is um, Animal Rehab Institute that runs a, a massage uh, course as well. Um, I might actually send that Anne's way. I don't know if Anne's still there. Yes, great. Um, about the um, antioxidant support for um, collateral ligament healing and seems like there's lots of discussion going on. <laughs> there was just one question, Anne, there on um, antioxidants that I, I don't know enough about. Oh, great. Thanks, Anne.
Okay, there's a question here about, um, a, a, I presume the horse had an adductor injury or a tear in the adductors and that, that the um, muscle is then shortened or contracted so that the fibres have, have shortened. Um, adductor, adductor injuries are difficult to deal, with, to deal with, stretching obviously as much as you can, but in hand work, getting the horse to really cross its hind limbs over. So basically, turning them short so that they actually really have to cross one leg over the other into the abduction and adduction phase um, is very very useful. I've treated a couple of cases um, with this type of injury. They are difficult to deal with unless you get them fairly early. Um, the scar tissue once it's really got you know tight is hard to lengthen. The horse is hard to stretch purely passively because they're standing and they won't really like to stretch into pain. A lot of deep soft tissue massage, frictions which go across the fibres as well as muscle stim basically to contract and relax the muscle to actually stretch the adhesions as well as um, things like ultrasound so that helps break down adhesions in conjunction with uh, your, your stretching and getting the horse to really cross over behind. I'm just sliding back here. Okay, regarding Sharon's question about what do you recommend with treating sore backs, it really is depending on what the source of the, the soreness or the back pain. Obviously you've addressed the saddle scenario. Um, I would literally start by doing some of the deep long stretching exercises so with the carrot between the front legs as low and as far back as you can go I would put the horse so that their butt or their hind quarter is in a corner so that they can't cheat and you want to do it repeatedly so you may do it about repetition to start with of five of each between the front legs and as low to the ground laterally either side um, the rounding responses so getting the horse to really lift up through their tummy and using your palpation uh, underneath the sternum and on the hind quarter to actually round the horse up the concern with back pain is really trying to get to the bottom of what's causing it um, depending on where you are and if you've got a veterinarian that deals with back problems to try to differentially diagnose it can be quite difficult. Um, either yourself massaging the horse or get a massage therapist or a physiotherapist or um, a professional person to come and look at the horse would be um, a primary goal. Okay, the locking stifles question from Stephanie. Um, depending on what the cause of the locking stifles or the patella luxation problem that some horses have, often it's related, not always, but often it's related to the muscle strength that controls the uh, muscles that, that um, lock and unlock the stifle. It can also be a problem within the stifle joint itself and the patella and also the ligament that hooks around the medial condyle. What I find very useful um, as a strengthening exercise is using pole work so getting the horse to actually really flex through its stifles using those little jangles um, again it depends on what the cause is um, it depends on how severe the problem is I often use taping exercises as well but the activate your core exercises and the weight shifting are really great to strengthen the stabilizing muscles around your patella so even the simple lateral movements where you take the, the, the chin or the, the mouth of the horse right down towards the hock either side and not let the horse take a step so in a corner can really help strengthen the whole hind quarter but it needs to be done regularly and really what the cause of the locking stifles really needs to be established. Okay, I'll just double check that there's nothing else for me and I'm quite tongue-tied. <laughs> yeah, pole and cavalier work are great for the core, especially for young horses. Great comment. Okay.
as you're finishing up your um, chatting in the chat box, I just want to read a brief conclusion, if that's okay with you now, Narelle. Okay, yeah, great. Sure. I just thank want to you. thank you, Narell, for your presentation this evening, and um, to Nicole and Anne for helping with the questions, and especially thank all of you for participating tonight. Later this week, you will receive an invitation by email to participate in an online survey about tonight's webcast, and if you would take a, just a couple of minutes to give us your feedback, that would be great and really help us out with planning future webcasts. And just want to remind you that next month will be our last webcast on this horse, horse health series. And the title of that is Equine Emergency First Aid. So be sure to sign up for that if that interests you. And My Horse University is also now on Facebook. So become our fan and you'll have access to exclusive deals and get the most up-to-date information on our events, courses, and more. And just a last reminder that our webcast tonight was recorded and will be uploaded to our website later tomorrow. And you can send us your comments and suggestions to info at myhorseuniversity.com. And thanks again and have a great evening. Thank you very much to My Horse University again and thanks to um, Anne and Nicole. And hope you all have a lovely evening.